And it's now time for member statements. And for the first statement, I turn to the member from Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. People in my riding of Niagara Centre are concerned about the future of their eye care. After decades of underfunding, optometrists and their patients are suffering. In Ontario, the government only covers an average of 55 per cent of the cost of an OHIP insured visit, the lowest rate in Canada. Now, as of September 1st, OHIP covered eye exams are at risk. Georgina from Welland is a kindergarten teacher. She's seen countless young students struggle to learn until they received an eye exam and it became apparent they needed glasses. Georgina said, quote, their parents are often struggling financially and do not have extra funds to pay for an eye exam or glasses. I have spent money from my own pocket to purchase glasses or replace broken or lost glasses for my students. Georgina's mother is a senior on a very fixed income. In her regular eye exam, her eye doctor observed that her retina had detached. Without this intervention, her mother might have lost her sight completely. Georgina is not alone in her concern. Countless seniors have reached out to my office worried about the future of their eye care. Speaker, eye care is health care. I urge this government to provide the financial supports necessary for optometrists to continue to keep their doors open and provide OHIP-covered eye examinations. The next member's statement, the member from Markham Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I stand here with a heavy heart and heart-wrenching memories of Tamil who perished during the last stage of the brutal war in Muli in May 2009. This is a very emotional moment for the Tamils, including myself, having been brought up in Venni region during my early childhood. Today marked the 12th year of Tamil Genocide Remembrance Day. Bishop Joseph Rajapu, a passionate human rights advocate and respected religious leader, who recently passed away, witnessed Sri Lankan armed forces suppress over 147,000 people, including women and children. Mr. Speaker, the war ended 12 years ago. Injustice done to them still remain unpunished today. Sadly, until now, the United Nations hasn't set up the mechanism for independent international investigation. There is no roadmap to end the ongoing oppression on Elam Tamil. We urge the Canadian government to involve with the United Nations to end this. Through Bill 104, we are seeing the new hope, and our voice has been heard. Thank you to the Member of Ontario Parliament for passing this bill. Mr. Speaker, we pay them my deepest respect for those who have lost their life. I understand and share the pain of those who have lost their loved ones. Our prayers go out to them, and their memories live with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. The next member's statement, the member from Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. One of the first things my office staff checks each day is who is eligible for vaccines. There's so much new information, and it is a challenge for anyone to keep up. When we know that there are appointments available, my office circles back to people who have reached out for help to get them to try again to book appointments. We've been very glad to do the vital work of helping neighbours get vaccinated. Speaker, since the beginning, health units have had to figure out things for themselves. Because while the province is responsible for the distribution of vaccines, they have not shown organized leadership, and what we have is a patchwork system of programs across the province. None of the government announcements have come with more people or more funding, and if the government really wants to focus on these hotspots and divert vaccines to them, then they need to provide the needed support to make sure they can get a lot of people vaccinated in those hotspots. When the province announced their list of hotspots, many were surprised by how many priority areas were missing. Oshawa has been missing. The Durham Health Department has found that the L1L neighbourhood in North Oshawa has the lowest vaccination rates in Durham Region and a high rate of COVID transmission. Beginning May 17th, it has been deemed by public health to be a local hotspot, and people who live or work in L1L will be able to book vaccine appointments. I am glad more people will be vaccinated, but South Oshawa also needs special consideration. The Health Department has told me we support vaccine prioritization in South Oshawa along with other areas in Oshawa. I know that the Health Department was not given the opportunity to recommend areas to the province for hot spots. Well, Speaker, I am recommending Oshawa neighbourhoods now to this government. Let's ensure folks that need protecting can have access to vaccines. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for Flamborough Glanville. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to express my gratitude to our pandemic heroes. These men and women, boys and girls, come from all walks of life, 
Ontarians who have stepped up to support their communities and help their neighbours weather the storm. This spring, I will be hosting a virtual award ceremony to recognize and honor some of these outstanding individuals in my riding of Flamborough-Glanbrook. The award recipients have been nominated by members of the community who have observed or been touched by their efforts. These inspiring individuals include Kevin Keat, a dedicated volunteer at Glanbrook Community Services who, with his positive spirit, has delivered meals to isolated residents. A group of women known as the St. James United Church Mask Makers who have created over 4,000 masks and donated proceeds of the effort to organizations that support the community. These small army of volunteers at the Food with Grace Water Down Food Bank who have gone above and beyond to collect and distribute donations to those in need. And John Gatto, the head custodian at St. Matthew Catholic Elementary School in Binbrook, who has been the first line of defense against the virus, keeping the school clean and staff and students safe. As we persevere in our efforts to bend the curve once and for all, let the sacrifices of these and countless other pandemic heroes remind us all of our responsibility to do our part just a little while longer. Thank you very much. Next, we have the member for Windsor to come see. Morning, Speaker. Down my way during Nursing Week, we honour an outstanding individual who has served the community through excellence in delivering patient care. Because of COVID-19, for the second year, the dedication of each and every nurse in Windsor and Essex County is being recognized. The local president of our RNAO chapter is Crystal Hepburn. She says this year the award recognizes the extreme dedication, loyalty, and hard work that all of our nurses are providing to ensure our community continues to be safe and healthy during this pandemic. Speaker, as a symbol of their service to our community, there will be a dedicated bench in Leamington Seacliff Park to recognize the valuable contribution of the nurses in Windsor and Essex County. The nurses have already established a similar bench in Windsor's Jackson Park and at the Health and Wellness Center in Amherstburg. Our nurses have been recognizing one of their own since 2008. The Nurse of the Year Award carries the name and honors the contribution of a former president of the ONA, Lois Fairley. She spent her career as a nurse and head nurse looking after patients at her former Salvation Army Grace Hospital. Speaker, as you know, this year's theme to Nursing Week is still standing, still proud, a theme that reflects the challenges that nurses have withstood throughout this pandemic and their remarkable resilience and dedication. During this pandemic, nurses have worked hard each and every day and night, every single shift, month after month. They are exhausted, yet they have persevered and continue to care for all of us in need. The courage, professionalism, and compassion they display is humbling. Nurses are loved, trusted, respected, and appreciated by their patients and by all of the people in Ontario and in this House, our provincial parliament. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Member statements? The member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, my statement today, Mr. Speaker, is about a constituent of mine named Mike Nemesberry, uh, who I had the pleasure of speaking with on March 18, 2021. Mike started out with a dream to become the premier freestyle skier in the world, and he was well on his way to achieving it. For well over a decade, Mike competed at the highest levels in Canada and internationally, winning dozens of championships, including World Cups as well as Canadian, European, and British skiing titles. Mike was reaching the pinnacle of his world-class skiing career when his entire world changed. A tragic accident in 1985 left him a quadriplegic. The Round the World Challenge is a six-month, 40,000-kilometer, 20-country journey to raise awareness and funds for enabling technologies which will improve the freedom, independence, and acceptance of people with disabilities, especially those with spinal cord injuries. In March 2001, Mike became the first quadriplegic to independently drive his heavily modified truck around the world, completing the Round the World Challenge. In March 21, 2021, 
Mike celebrated the 20th anniversary of this project with a virtual tour around the planet, retracing his tour and highlighting the accomplishments of two decades ago. More importantly, it compared where the world was then to where it is now. To find out more about Mike and the challenge, you can visit www.roundtheworldchallenge.com. Thank you. Thank you. The member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it's been a very difficult year for our kids, so this morning I rise to recognize the strength and the resilience of the children and youth in Ontario. After more than a year of disruption, we know that online learning doesn't work. Students are frustrated and falling behind, and some are just not showing up. Parents and educators are exhausted, trying so hard to make it work. 70% of teachers surveyed worried the kids won't catch up academically. Yet we continue to see this government flatlining education funding and now proposing a hybrid model of learning for next year, but without additional funding. Tragically, we are seeing the devastating impact of social isolation on children's health and well-being. Bruce Squires, the president of McMaster Children's Hospital, reports that the number of youth being admitted after a suicide attempt has tripled this year. An Ontario soccer survey found that without youth soccer, 40 per cent of respondents reported feeling anxiety, stress and worried, while 20 per cent not noted depression. Mr. Speaker, our kids are not okay and we need to start listening to them. Students are calling on the Ontario government to allow COVID safe outdoor graduation ceremonies. Kids are pleading, let us play. Unfortunately, the PC government just voted down our motion to safely reopen outdoor recreational facilities to boost physical and mental health. The Premier just teased that summer camps will be open, but so far has provided no details. Kids don't need to be held in suspense. They don't need more empty words without a plan. We must act to prioritize the mental health of Ontario's three million children and youth now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next member statement, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, May 18th, marks the 12th anniversary of the Muli Vikan genocide. This is a day when Tamils in Canada and around the world will join together in remembering the end of the 25-year-long civil war that claimed the lives of thousands of innocent civilians on both sides. As Tamils commemorate those who were lost, it is also important to acknowledge the process of rebuilding, which is ongoing today. Today, I also um, reflects on the pain and the suffering of this atrocity. It is also apparent that significant steps have been taken towards the preservation and expansion of the cultural heritage of Tamil people, including here in Ontario. In this House, we unanimously passed the member of Scarborough Rouge Park's Bill 104, which dedicates a week of educating about genocides so we never repeat them. Notably, a campaign to establish a chair in Tamil studies at the University of Toronto Scarborough, the first of its kind in Canada, has reached its three million philanthropic goal. More than 3,800 donors contributed to the grassroots campaign, which was spearheaded by the Canadian Tamil Congress and Tamil Chair Inc. in 2018. Tamil is among the world's seven classical languages, and it reflects a rich cultural heritage that spans more than 2,000 years. The east part of Toronto is home to the largest concentration of Tamil people outside of the Indian subcontinent. I'm inspired by the strong ties of kinship shared between members of the Tamil Canadian community and the dedication Tamils show to improving the lives of their neighbours. As a member of Provincial Parliament for Scarborough Guildwood, I truly appreciate the strength and perseverance of the Tamil Canadian communities across Ontario, and I stand here and join with all of you in wishing them a peaceful and prosperous future. The next statement, the member for Peterborough Kawartha. Speaker, yesterday was International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia, and Biophobia. Today, I'd like to introduce you to a very good friend of mine, Rose Powers. Rose is an absolute force for good in our community. I first met her when we were both involved in hockey in Peterborough. Rose was the president of the Peterborough Girls Hockey Association, and at the time I was director of player development for the Peterborough Community Church Hockey League. Rose helped me immensely with a number of projects, like the End of the Lock Tournament and Hockey Day in Canada. She has a reputation that if you want something done well, you enlist Rose's help. Speaker, Rose has a project that she's been working on for the last couple of years, and it's one that everyone needs to know about. It's called Sport a Rainbow. The concept is really simple. 
You take the, the pledge and you sport a rainbow sticker to show your support. Speaker, here's the, the pledge. By sporting a rainbow, I understand that all athletes, coaches and competitors deserve to participate in sport free of judgment. I will help by speaking up against hateful speech and actions in my sport because it's more than just the game. Speaker, I proudly took the pledge when Rose first started it, and I encourage everyone to go to www.sportarainbow.ca, take the pledge, and get behind this fantastic initiative. Because as Rose says, it's more than just the game. The next member's statement, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, today I rise to highlight the phenomenal work uh, being done from Northumberland Manufacturers Association and a recent virtual career fair that they held. A special thank you to the phenomenal team, Fred, Darla, Melissa, entire team at NMA for doing this. The fair was an industry-led event to recruit college, university and high school graduates looking at a rewarding career in manufacturing. The purpose of event? was to hire new talent, open new connections and relationships, learn and promote internships, apprenticeships, and to continue to build relationships between industry and post-secondary institutions. The event included a keynote speaker who gave a virtual plant tour of Charlotte products in Peterborough. Both items focused on careers in manufacturing, and speaker, it was directed towards students in my community. The event had 27 manufacturers in attendance, 170 graduates, six post-secondary schools, high school speaker. This was truly a remarkable event. I'm told students have already been in for internship interviews. Students have been asked to come in, and many are well on their way to a rewarding career in manufacturing. I also know that local high school teachers are now in direct contact with manufacturers in our community. Building these important linkages is critical, speaker. Speaker, this event, along with Mermo's recent expansion to Campbellford, hiring now to growing their company to over 100 employees with well-paying jobs like machine operators, drafters, and engineering personnel, shows that manufacturing in Northumberland is alive and well, Speaker. Speaker, I would again like to thank the remarkable team at NMA. Thank you for the work you do, and thank you to all the manufacturers in Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our member's statements for this morning. Member